Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God for our consideration tonight are uh, sections of the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 14. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing again, just a bit of it to get us back into the context of the account. Uh, Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for eight years during high school and college, I spent my summers working on a family farm. My, my purpose there was especially to help with putting up hay for the coming year. And on days in which we were baling hay, uh, I might uh, be expected to lift as many as 2,050 pound bales. That, if you do a little quick math, means 50 tons of hay in a day. It was backbreaking work. On those days when we were putting up hay, uh, we would generally keep ourselves strong for the task by eating extra meals. We ate five meals on those days. Uh, There was an early breakfast and a mid-morning breakfast. There was dinner at noon. There was sandwiches in the middle of the afternoon that we referred to as lunch. And then there was supper after we had finished the evening chores. Now, for all of those meals, they were kind of a welcome relief and rest from the work of the day. But it was especially that mid-afternoon lunch of sandwiches that we had that would provide a a respite that would allow you to recharge before you had to go and face the, the hard work that still lay ahead. You, you, you needed that, that break and that food to continue. I have often said that food is like fuel. Sometimes it's not so much about how it tastes or what exactly it is that you're eating, but you simply need to put some gas back in the tank regardless. And yet, at the same time, we we also recognize that when we are having meals with other people, sometimes that pause to eat is about more than just the food itself. When we are gathering with family or friends, especially when we are doing so to celebrate a big occasion in the family, well, well, then the, the purpose of the meal may be as much or more about the love and the friendship as it is about the food on the table. The, the meal, while it is what we are gathering around, becomes somewhat secondary. And with uh, such meals in life, too, there is a, a break from the regular pattern of life, uh, Uh, An opportunity to escape from the hard work of living, a a respite, if you will. I I realize that those who are getting the food on the table may be working hard to do so. But when the mealtime itself comes, the work stops. And we pause and rest to eat. At the table, then, we rest We nourish, we love, we celebrate. 
And that was also true of the meal for which Jesus and his disciples were gathered, the Passover, in our lesson tonight. As it is also true for us who have gathered here to receive the meal that Jesus places before us. As with Jesus and his disciples, so also tonight for us at his table, at his supper. Our Savior is providing us a respite. And, and here we bring to the conclusion our Lenten series on God on trial, away from the trial now, away from that hard work to a respite. A respite we find at Christ's table and in his presence. It was Jesus' disciples who actually made the preparations for this last Passover meal between Jesus and them that we know as the Last Supper. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when the sacrifice, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of that house, the teacher says, Where's my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Well, this was the fifth night that Jesus and his disciples were spending in Jerusalem or the surrounding area. And, and of course, on the other nights that they had been there together, they, they ate supper together also. But there was something different, something different about this meal. As is a part of the Passover table liturgy or script when that feast is celebrated to this very day. It falls to the youngest person at the table to to mark the point that there is something different here by asking the question, why is this night different from all the other nights? The people at this table, at these tables, all have something in common. They are the people whom God had set free from their slavery and from death in Egypt. They were the people upon whom the Lord had set his heart and claimed them as his very own. So Jesus himself paused from his hard work this week to celebrate the Passover. And this demonstration of God's deliverance and God's special grace and love to his people. It had been a strenuous week already for Jesus in these past five days. Every day found him teaching and preaching in the temple. And it was not only that he was preaching and teaching there, but every day found him constantly being challenged with antagonistic questions by those who hated him and wanted to trap him. And throughout all of that time, certainly weighing upon his mind in the back of his head must have been the heavy purpose for which he had come to Jerusalem in the first place. This Passover meal offered a respite, a break, as even Christ could live in the saving promises of God for a little while and the fellowship of these faithful men who had stood by him these past three years. No wonder he told the disciples at the very beginning of the meal, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Of all the Passovers God's people had celebrated now for some 1,400 years, this one was remarkable. This one stood out above all the rest because this one was not only going to be a look back 
to celebrate the deliverance God had brought upon his people in the past. But this one would reach forward to embrace and to include the special deliverance that God was about to give the world from its sin. The fulfillment of Jesus' saving work. Jesus, too, then, here, could find rest and strength at this table as the disciples could if they were paying attention. Are we paying attention? We don't call it the Passover anymore because in the meal that Jesus has given us, he's given us something so much more. And yet it is at a similar feast, a fulfilled feast, a a realization of the full meaning of that feast that Jesus now gives us the gifts he wants us to have here, the full expression of his love. You know, so many times as we day by day eat our ordinary meals, we, we hardly pause to stop and think, about how dearly must God, God must love us to take care of us so. I mean, maybe we pause to say uh, our dinner prayers before we dig in. Maybe we forget. We just stuff our faces. But so rarely do we really pause to ponder and think about the great care and love God must have for us to take care of us so. Perhaps if we have known real hunger in our lives or real, real poverty, well, well, then we are more aware. But, but you need to know that the, the way in which God is taking care of us just ordinarily, day by day, is, you know, it is no less miraculous than that manna that fell before the children of Israel in the desert as he continues to fill our plates and care for our bodies. Many millions do not eat so well or so often. Where is our gratitude? But the table that Jesus sets before us tonight, well, that itself is no ordinary meal. It is the Lord's Supper He doesn't give it as food for our bodies. He he gives it as food for our souls, perhaps. Perhaps because we're going to find it again a a couple of Sundays from now offered to us, and then a couple Sundays after that, and then, then every Sunday or every other Sunday all through the year in such a manner. We, with that meal, with this meal too, don't pause to consider how dearly must God love us that he would choose to feed our souls and take care of us so. But so he does. And for you and for me, like those ordinary meals here too, for our souls, our spirits, we find a rest, a respite, an opportunity to pause and break from the sorrow and the, the heavy toil of life. We can come here and put the heavy burden down And find our Lord serving us with his promises of grace. Here, we celebrate something greater than God's ancient deliverances of his people from hard labor and from their deadly plagues. Here, we receive his own deliverance to us from the from the domination of our sins and from the death that should have been the consequences for you and for me. The Apostle Paul celebrates this in his first letter to the Corinthians when he writes them, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As surely as a sermon may preach the cross of Christ and the forgiveness that is offered to us as a result. So here at this table, we have that same cross and that same forgiveness of sins presented clearly before us as a respite for our souls, a place to find our rest. Here too, 
we find that we do not face our spiritual journey alone. God has not left us to make our way through this world by ourselves. But as we stand side by side, we find that we are joined to other Christians, other people of God, those who share our faith, who share our need, who need God's grace just as we do. That too, Paul spoke in the second lesson we had tonight, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread, the love of these brothers and sisters. It may be weak and faltering compared to the love that Christ has for you or for me. But it is no less a gift of God that we don't make our way through life alone, that we don't live our faith alone. But with those he's gathered and united to me, to you, in faith. We have this respite we find at this table. Now, if this was all that Christ had to offer us in his supper, at his table, that we would have a pause from our work and the promise of his grace and a preaching of his cross and the love of a Christian family, well, then that alone should be enough to lead us to hunger, to have it every day. But our Lord has not stopped there. And so we find that as he invites us to his table, we have this one more feature. He comes to us as host himself. We receive his grace in his presence. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. All over the world, people are desperately seeking God. As we see our own country become more and more agnostic and secular and jaded and cynical. Maybe we think it's just the opposite. Just this past week, there was an article in the uh, news site Axios that revealed the results of a poll in which those questioned were asked how many of them attend religious services seldom or never. And In New England and parts of the West Coast, the answer was well above 65%, seldom or never, some above 75%. Across our nation as a whole, it's about 50%. And on figures like that, we might be led to conclude that the people don't want God anymore. They aren't looking for him any longer. I don't believe that that is the conclusion to draw. When we or our neighbors are trying to fill that hole we feel inside to to find our satisfaction in things like sexual experiences, like mind-altering substances, like ever-growing collections of trinkets from things we buy on Amazon, to homes and cars that are more than we can afford, to finding our way someplace around the world to an expensive escape at some popular world destination, you can be sure that the people who are doing so are, in a sense, on a kind of search for God. They're they're searching for peace. They're looking to fill something in their life. Only God has not promised to be found in those places. Other more spiritual people may think that they can find him by searching through their inner feelings. Or still others, in the emotional songs and music and message that they find at church. And it is true that Jesus, that God may be found in the music or message of church when it is speaking his word. 
But that is not to be measured or determined by the emotional response that one has when exposed. Why not find him where he's promised to be found? This is my body. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Perhaps we're not going to be hit by some bolt of spiritual lightning when we come forward and stand together and receive a little bite of bread and a little sip of wine together. That does not change the fact. That something more real is here. That something more substantial is here. It's taking place in front of this altar. The Savior, who sacrificed his body to save you, is now giving that body, that very body, to you. The Savior, who poured out his blood to remove all your sin, is now pouring that blood into your mouth because there is no more sin to separate you and him. He's here. He is present at his table. He is present in the bread and wine. He is present with you. You receive his presence. You stand in his presence. you can be assured of his presence. We can retire from the long search. Jesus is here to give us rest, respite, relief in his presence at his feast. At our Savior's table, descended from the Passover, now our Lord's Supper. We find more than food. We find God's love. May it bring peace and rest to your souls. Amen. Please stand.